The next speaker is uh, Dr. Jayan Menon, uh, which is called Jay. Uh, uh, he's actually working at the uh, ISIS, uh, Yusuf Ajak Institute in Singapore, a former uh, economist, uh, lead economist at the uh, Asian Development Bank. So uh, Jay, you have the floor. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Sajibant. And uh, let me also start by thanking the organizers for having me here today. Um, I'm very pleased to be joining this event. Now, uh, let me uh, try and share my screen. I'm sure you will tell me if you cannot see it. Uh, but uh, let me just see. Yeah, so I've uh, given my talk today uh, Pro, uh, provocative title on purpose, um, just to get people thinking. Um, but um, so I pose the question whether we need, whether there might be a post pandemic disintegration. Um, um, and I think uh, we need to be concerned about that and we need to be thinking about how uh, we can avoid that. Um, but there are a number of forces working in that direction, uh, pick up on a few of the things that Mia mentioned uh, in her talk earlier on. Um, but uh, I'll talk mainly about a few of these long-term trends that started uh, before the pandemic, but have accelerated uh, because of it. Um, and here I'll focus on the move or the acceleration towards a more digital economy, um, and its consequences, uh, especially on inequality, but also how it might try and uh, deal with uh, increasing inclusion uh, as well, right? So the story is not all negative. Um, and um, then I want to talk about the adjustment costs that the region faces in a post-pandemic uh, new normal. Um, well, the pandemic is not over. In fact, uh, it's far from over. It's actually uh, reaching its peak in many countries in this region, unfortunately, as we know. Uh, so, uh, you know, when we speak of a post-pandemic uh, uh, new normal, this might be uh, some uh, distance away, unfortunately. We don't know. Uh, so we have to deal with uh, the pandemic and the post-pandemic new normal in thinking about our responses for policy. Um, so the direct impacts of the pandemic we have to deal with uh, and the things that it's inducing or accelerating um, digital economy and also divergent demographics, which create both challenges and opportunities. Uh, so here I want to finish off by looking at what policy can do, um, you know, the role of increasing factor mobility, uh, labor and capital in particular, and why that might be difficult uh, in a post-pandemic world, uh, given the fallout from the pandemic, um, and how uh, maybe trade may have to play a substituting role especially uh, in the short run, but also uh, how it can continue into the long run where other policy changes will be required. Okay, then I'll just summarize. Okay, so let me start with the digital economy. Uh, and we all, uh, I think, uh, accept and realize that it's accelerating the move towards a more digital uh, economy. In fact, there's no better example of that than what we're doing right now. Uh, you know, uh, we're all staring at computer screens all around the world uh, as we have this conference, all of which has been made possible by, you know, an acceleration in the adoption of these sorts of new technologies uh, and also the creation of new ones and all kinds of new forms of service delivery. Uh, but this is having both positive and negative uh, effects. Uh, the main negative impact is the concern that inequality is rising, 
both within and between countries, um, and uh, how um, you know access to these technologies is unequal uh, within countries and between countries. But within countries, it depends a lot on your income. Um, but between countries, it depends on preparedness. Uh, you know, the poorer countries are much less prepared uh, than the developed countries. And this will create, uh, uh, you know, uh, a widening of the digital divide that already exists. And we need to try and narrow or close that gap as we go forward. But uh, uh, it's likely to narrow if you do nothing or if you don't do enough. Uh, it's unlikely to narrow if we don't do uh, enough uh, to close it. And the uh, skills premiums will also start rising in this more digitized world uh, where, you know, if you have the right set of skills uh, with the right kind of education and training, you can, uh, you know, demand uh, a lot uh, higher returns for them in uh, higher wages. Um, and this will add to wage inequality. Um, and then you've got also the whole disruption or labor churning impacts uh, that will likely affect the lower skilled workers more than the others, especially in initially. So automation and robotics will start having displacement effects uh, with low skill workers before it moves on to the other higher skills. <clears throat> right, so uh, a lot of the repetitive tasks in supply chains uh, are at risks, uh, are at risk, <coughs> excuse me, and the uh, low skill workers might be first to be displaced. Now there are various uh, offsetting effects as well that we should not overlook. Uh, we tend to overlook them because uh, they will take time to materialize, but uh, the digital economy can create new ways of uh, include, including uh, or inclusion uh, operating through a number of channels. Uh, first, of course, it will increase connectivity in various ways, um, increasing information sharing, uh, increasing, uh, you know, uh, all kinds of, uh, sharing of prices and distribution. Uh, this will not be confined just to, um, you know, the uh, manufacturing sector, but even agriculture. Uh, and uh, it can also support um, uh, um, MSMEs, micro and small medium enterprises. Uh, here, blockchain technology can allow them to engage in cross-border transactions. Um, and uh, allow you know, a small firm in the most remote part of a developing country's country engage the global economy uh, through these technologies. So um, a lot of these things are possible um, simply through a smartphone uh, and which are becoming more and more affordable. So there are these uh, positive inclusive aspects of the digital economy that we should not ignore. <clears throat> but I think um, we should accept also that uh, despite these offsets, the uh, net impact is likely to be negative, especially in the short run. Uh, so the overall impact in the short run will be most likely uh, negative, uh, and we need to consider those implications. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so uh, on top of the impacts from the digital economy, uh, I think uh, the pandemic itself is going to directly have various negative impacts, which will uh, linger for quite a while, even when it's over. And this is um, uh, you know, likely to manifest in increased unemployment, increased poverty, and increase inequality. 
there's concern that decades of uh, success in poverty reduction is being uh, reversed. And you know, because of various uh, aspects of unequal access, uh, a cycle of intergenerational inequality and poverty is being set in as the poor are unable to engage in say learning and education because of limited access to these technologies for distance learning uh, and so on. So um, uh, the digital economy's impacts, which would be net negative, will be compounded by the direct impacts of pandemic fallout, uh, which will raise um, unemployment, poverty, and inequality. So we need to look at these realities um, and see, look at ways in which uh, where we can try and minimize the costs. So tackling rising unemployment among the lower skilled workers, uh, which cannot move very easily across sectors or occupations, and the widening wage disparities due to the skills premium uh, will be key to addressing rising inequality, both during and after the pandemic. So let me now turn uh, to what we can do uh, in addressing them in the short run. Um, I think the direct, most direct way of trying to do this is to try and increase factor mobility, uh, increase uh, cross-border movement of labor, capital, technology. Um, uh, now, uh, this need is uh, increased uh, by the fact that we have divergent demographic trends in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, and this will add to disruption uh, as well. So, um, you know, if you look at ASEAN, uh, you know, ASEAN is aging, but not all of ASEAN is aging at the same rate. Uh, so the uh, newest members, uh, uh, Cambodia, Laos, and Myanmar, uh, are, have relatively young populations compared to the rest of ASEAN. And of course, uh, East Asia, uh, China, Japan, and Korea is aging quite rapidly. But India has a relatively uh, young population and growing uh, labor force, uh, while many uh, the other countries in East Asia have shrinking labor force, right? So, um, so the younger populations, uh, all in the in the Pacific, uh, tend to be in the poorer countries, while the aging populations are in both rich and poor. But in the rich countries, they are aging quite rapidly. So you can see there's an obvious uh, win-win type. Uh, possibility here of getting people uh, you know, uh, in poorer countries where are more likely to be displaced, the low-skilled workers, uh, to move um, to countries that have shrinking labor forces uh, and need them going forward, um, right? So uh, these sorts of factor movements can reduce differences in capital labor ratios uh, and also assist in productivity catch up for more inclusive growth uh, going forward. Now the problem though, uh, with uh, all of this, uh, which Mia spoke about as well, uh, is that the pandemic is reinforcing uh, a number of trends, uh, pre-existing trends that were undermining globalization even before the pandemic started, right? Uh, you know, the pandemic is heightening this uh, feelings of nationalism. Uh, we're seeing that with the vaccine distribution, but in so many other areas as well, um, on immigration and the like, and uh, protectionism, right? Now, protection uh, has a new name every few years. It used to be called rebalancing. And uh, more recently now it's been called reshoring and it's starting to be called resilience. Of course, there's lots of aspects of this resilience, which is, um, you know, um, quite good, but it can be abused 
uh, you know, to support vested interests who can, you know, use this claim of re increasing resilience to uh, push forward their uh, interests in protecting, uh, you know, uh, domestic market shares, uh, domestic employment and the like. So we need to be wary that uh, protection can come in various guises uh, and can parade as being, you know, uh, quite uh, serving that, uh, good interests, when in fact it might uh, be just another way of, uh, you know, uh, concentrating uh, domestic uh, market share or domestic forces. Um, so the uh, pandemic uh, is increasing the need for greater factor mobility, while at the same time, reducing the appetite for it or reducing the likelihood that it will take place. So this is a, a con very concerning, uh, you know, uh, situation, right? Yeah. So I think uh, as we have seen, borders are, are still remain close, especially in Asia to uh, people movement. And it's going to take a long time uh, to reverse that. Uh, even when this pandemic is, you know, declared over, um, I think we'll find that uh, there'll be, you know, hysteresis, uh, what economists call hysteresis, or, you know, persistence, persistent effects that linger in the post-pandemic new normal when it comes to factor movements. Um, and um, this is where I think trade will need to play a bigger role uh, now and into the future. Uh, because trade can partly substitute for these factor movements and produce outcomes that are similar in nature in dealing with these adjustment costs. Uh, we know this from you know, the factor price equalization theorem that Samuelson developed many years ago, uh, but it's been generalized now to, to be applicable in you know, much more uh, you know, real world like situations where you can get factor prices, um, you know, wages and rentals equalizing um, through trade, even when those factors themselves do not move. Uh, so, um, uh, so trade can mimic a lot of the positive impacts of factor movements uh, and this is where regional agreements um, involving countries of the Indo-Pacific, like uh, the ASEAN Economic Community, RCEP, CPTPP, and of course the WTO. Uh, let's not forget uh, the WTO uh, that might hopefully see a bit of a revival now, uh, can play, must play uh, a more important role uh, in dealing with uh, uh, post uh, uh, dealing with the remainder of this pandemic and a post pandemic uh, new normal. Right, so I've hit my time. So let me quickly conclude. Uh, I think uh, you know we have to realize that uh, uh, the future remains uncertain, but also relatively bleak, unfortunately, if we don't do something about it. Uh, the pandemic's push towards the digital economy is likely to worsen uh, a lot of the inequalities that were already present. Uh, and the digital economy can create a lot of positive impacts, but it'll be net negative, uh, I think, in the short run. Uh, in the long run, it might be net positive, but you know we all live in the short run. We have to do something about the short run, which is a short and medium run, which is, you know, the, the remainder of this uh, uh, decade almost. Um, and so uh, the pandemic fallout as well directly uh, will increase the need uh, for such actions. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, there, could, there will be permanent effects uh, at the end of this pandemic, whenever that is. We will see you know, uh, a more, a greater pool of uh, the poor, um, you know, a greater pool of, uh, um, you know, people um, that are marginalized um, and inequalities of all kinds are likely to have risen 
as a result of this pandemic. And there could be some intergenerational impacts, which are particularly worrying. So policies, I think, that increase factor mobility can, a redu can reduce a lot of these uh, adjustment costs in the short run. But the problem is that they're going to be more difficult to implement. Uh, they're going to be more difficult because of this uh, reinforcement of uh, the backlash against globalization that started a long time ago, but will become a lot stronger because of the pandemic. Um, and so uh, we will see that the appetite for these types of uh, sensitive policies, increasing labor and capital mobility, will be low uh, for quite some time. So in that environment, I think, uh, the less sensitive sort of policies, you know, relatively speaking, like trade reforms, trade liberalization, will have to play a bigger role uh, to in reducing adjustment costs. We've seen how, you know, uh, trade uh, in goods at least uh, have has uh, not been much affected during this pandemic. Um, trade in services of the traditional form, you know, the people movement, uh, service uh, movements. Uh, uh, have been low, but there have been new types of uh, trade that has grown. Digital trade has uh, uh, grown sharply, uh, and new forms of service delivery have allowed other types of services trade to grow. Uh, so trade, I think, will be easier uh, to rely upon uh, in a post-pandemic world to play the role of adjustment as an adjuster or equil uh, equilibrator. Uh, as we go forward, uh, because it can produce the kind of outcome similar to those from greater factor mobility. But in the long term, uh, we'll need uh, systemic changes um, to address uh, many of the challenges from the pandemic and from the fourth industrial revolution, uh, including the increase in, in uh, all kinds of inequality. So in the longer term, we will need to look at ways in which we transform our education systems with lifelong learning and create uh, you know, more flexible workforces, um, as well as to create deeper local, local capital and uh, financial markets, which we will need in a world that you know, has a tendency now to look more inward than outward. And I think that will remain, unfortunately, for quite a few years to come uh, in a post-pandemic new normal. So uh, I too must apologize for going a bit over time, but you've been very generous in not interrupting me, Sutipan. So thank you for that. And let me turn this back to you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I think, uh, well, I think we went agree very much for what you had just said about the looking at the uh, pandemic uh, uh, impact uh, both uh, the fallout in short term and as well if you try to look at more long-term structural issue that uh, we should focus and uh, while you have made several points I'm sure that we, that could come back into the, the discussion uh, uh, of course, uh, it's quite clear that, uh, you know, that uh, we all now become clear about the pandemic itself, uh, to, you know, where will be we are, you know, that's, uh, from the kind of the lockdown to the kind of the mobility we can uh, make. And uh, particularly, I think to try to raise as we look at the uh, uh, you know, that uh, the uh, other countries in the region is so important to look at the, you know, the kind of the change that already take place. Uh, uh, the, the digital uh, economy, you, I think you, you raised a very important point uh, of uh, the kind of things that may bring to us, particularly the, the you know, the, 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 the inequality side, but uh, as well, we need to, to look at the, the, the growth side, you know, that uh, of course, but uh, it, as you 
try to say in short term that rather have uh, the fallout on, on people, uh, unemployment, the skill that we need to, to look at, and those who, you know, that uh, not have the ability, you know, kind of digital divide that we talked before the crisis is still a big problem and uh, the pandemic could, could, could deepen. Uh, that's how uh, this is very important for policymakers to, to look at. Um, and uh, as well, I think that you look at the structural issue about the, the, the aging, you know, the, the kind of population, you know, because we, you look at the longer term, this is another challenge as if we look at this kind of change better the aging population countries could better adapt or those uh, younger population probably have more advantage. So all kinds of things, uh, if you put in a bag and, and uh, we need to, to take care. So uh, I think this is quite important to, again, to uh, look looking into the future. 